Hey, this is Glendon Cameron with another edition of HustlersKungFu.com, The Art of Making Money Online. Today's guest is a little different. He's down in Mexico. He doesn't have a camera, so we just decided to do it strict podcast style. You're going to love it. Russell brings a great deal of information. I've known Russell for about three years. We've talked quite a bit. And he's a very different guy. During our conversation, I got to learn that he's entirely self-taught. Everything that he knows how to do, he taught himself, including writing 48 novels in four years, or roughly 42 months. We actually talk about that quite a bit. One of the reasons that I brought Russell on was when I was l listening to a podcast that he did with... Hugh Howley, I believe, he put in this quote that everything that he knows how to do, he's put in 15, 18 hours a day. He's had several businesses, he's been really successful, and he brings some really good podcasts, some information. He doesn't really hold stuff back, and he's extremely opinionated because we're Facebook friends, and his page is always full of very intriguing, in-depth type stuff. So I think you're going to really, really enjoy that. But before we get into that, you know what it is. This is, yes, boom. I will let you know that you have until September 30th to get the Hustlers Kung Fu dot com bundle which is all of these courses there's more there's more hold on wait for it wait for it there's more you get all of these courses plus whatever course comes in the future plus you get to be an affiliate plus you get some extra stuff that we'll get into later on but you can go ahead and get this at hustlerskungfu.com there would be either an I if you are on mobile that you can click to get the special. And if you're on desktop, you will see the annotations. So with that, let's jump into what Russell has to say. Hopefully you will enjoy it. I know I did. And more importantly, hopefully you will learn something. It is a lot. Oh, so what I'm going to do, since you don't have a camera, I'm just going to put a static picture so we, we're not looking all crazy. And... Uh, okay. We'll just do it podcast style because the reason I wanted to bring you on was I remember in that interview you had with Hugh Howie, you had mentioned your businesses. And I was like, how many businesses has Russell started? Because that's something I don't know about you. I know about your blog. I know about your epic uh, work ethic. It is epic. I mean, it is definitely atypical. But what did you do before you started writing? Well, I... Uh... I had a uh, design and build company for custom homes here in Mexico. I live, I've been here, boy, I want to say 12 or 13 years now. Okay. And when, when I moved down here, I sort of got really bored staring at my navel after about a couple, three years. So I was, I was watching, I had some friends that were, um, involved in the real estate game and I was looking at some houses with them and things just weren't built very well. I was like, wow, you know, I bet you I could do better than this. And so I, you know, be careful what you wish for. I started a, uh, a design and build company and um, wound up building, I want to say I designed something like 60 four 65 homes and I wound up building 13 or 14 of them and we're talking big places we're talking you know six seven eight thousand square feet on the beach whoa so, that, that is yeah. definitely it now is it like the part of Mexico that you're in is it like close to California because I'm unfamiliar with it or are you just it's well we're we're about 950 miles south of California but okay. you know it, it it's really, it's, 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 you know, I refer to it as La Jolla South because, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, I, yes, there are Mexicans here cause it's Mexico, but you also see like, you know, sort of a who's who list of people from La Jolla and Newport beach because mm -hmm. everybody keeps their boats down here and they fly in on their private jets on weekends. Well, that's what I was thinking. Cause like when you are in Texas and you cross the border, you're in Mexico, but it's not 
a radical departure from the United States because it's so close and there's so much things going right. on. Yeah, so I, I get that. So you just out of the blue to say that I'm going to start this design home building business and just went for it. Well, I had to teach myself architecture first. So I did that and then uh, I got pretty good at it. And then, yeah, I started designing homes and a couple of them caught the eye of some some potential clients and they liked what they saw. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another. And then pretty soon I was I was building houses. Man, now. You hear these stories, and one of the things that uh, I like to do is talk to people who are in different countries who are right there, you know, some called boots on the ground. How is it living in Mexico compared to living in the U.S. since you've done both? Well, I don't want to piss off anybody that's living in the U.S. because, you know, they'll be like, oh, you're so anti-American. But I mean, you know. <laughs> Guess what? I mean, you know, it's it's awesome. I mean, really, it is. Um, it's 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 incredible. And Mexico is very unlike, I think, the way many people view um, it because of the media's portrayal. I mean, if I turn on if I turn on Yahoo News, scares it just scares the crap out of me. It's you know, it's like oh, there's cartel killers behind every cactus, and you know, it's basically a bunch of guys in like white PJs and wearing sombreros leading burros around. It's just couldn't be further. I mean, sh certainly there's there's portions of the country like that, right, right? But for the most part, for the most part, you go to any decent sized city in in Mexico, and it's like going to any medium sized city in the U.S. I mean, you see Chili's, you see Olive Garden, you see, you know, Best Buy, you see Costco, Home Depot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's not nearly as different as I think most people believe. Well, that's one reason it's, I want, you know, you to explain it, because I've been to Mexico and I have been to Mexico. I've seen things that just kind of blow your mind because what we get here, that a lot of the immigrants are really, I'm not going to say that they're, they're the poor people. Let's just say they're the poor people. Well, yeah, of course. No, the yeah. rich Mexicans have no interest in moving none. to the U.S. None, none, none. none They've whatsoever. got it pretty good here. It's awesome to, to be rich and Mexican. I mean, trust me, it's good. It's awesome to be rich in anything, but right. especially in a country where the cost of living is, you know, I mean, you can live like a frigging king for you know 40 grand a year in most of mexico i mean that's high living that's restaurants every night that's i mean you know you've got a full-time maid you're yeah you're you're styling so so those folks aren't um trying to sneak across the border in mm -hmm. the middle of the night um it, it's it's the it's the it's the guys that are construction workers they're laborers they get paid down here probably 1200 pesos a week if that so they're getting you know 60 70 dollars a week they're the ones that you know kind of want to make it to the u.s where that same job pays you know 25 dollars an hour but there's definitely two class systems in mexico and it's very much like the u.s in that regard except that the u.s has done very well at making its poor not nearly as uncomfortable and poor as someplace like Mexico, like, you know, Mexico poor is way different than the U S poor. Oh, uh, very uh, different. Oh, the, the rest of the world. I was trying to explain this to a friend, poor people in the rest of the world are truly poor, abject poverty, no health insurance, you know, going to the river to get oh, they're water. Freaking miserable. They, yeah. They die because they're poor. I mean, yeah. 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 And, and you, you just can't explain it because when I was trying to tell this guy that, you know, the Mexicans that you see who immigrate here are so different from the middle class, the rich Mexicans. I was like, just go ahead and watch Univision and you, you will. That's what you're going to. That's what that's how they live. And he just couldn't believe right. it. He, he would just there's this image, like you said, that they're all are like that. Uh, the poor Mexicans and they have no clue to how these people live. Because I think well, and also I think a lot of the people that emigrate to the United States that are taking the low um, paid jobs, you know, we sort of say in the U.S. they say generically they classify those as Mexicans, but they aren't. A lot, most of them are from El Salvador. They're from um, Guatemala. They're from extremely poor 
extremely violent countries where they don't have any other options. So they're sneaking across the border along with the very poor Mexicans who are, they're very poor here in Mexico and they're going to be very poor in the United States. But if they go to the U.S. and they cut their foot off, um, you know, they have an accident, they can go to an emergency room and get seen and they'll get seen. You know, if they've got pneumonia, they'll get seen. Whereas in, in Mexico or Guatemala or El Salvador, they'll just die. Yeah. And also, you, so it's you, a different, you, it's a different thing. You just uh, really confirmed something else because I was trying to tell someone that a lot of the Mexicans that were come here were descendants from Incas because he, he I was trying to show him because we were, I don't know if you've ever been to Georgia, we were near Linux and there was this Mexican woman who was definitely a rich Mexican. I said, look, you know, she's even built different. And he's like, she's not Mexican. I said, yeah, she is Mexican. And they just, I, I don't even know. I think a lot of it comes because a lot of people in the U.S. just don't travel. They don't get outside of the United well, no, States. No, there's xenophobic. I mean, if you if you if you follow the U.S. media, I mean, it definitely sponsors um, you know fear of other cultures, mm -hmm. and you know while promoting quote. I mean, it's very big on lip service to racial equality and cultural equality and this and that and the other. But the truth is, it it fosters an agenda of xenophobia, where you should be scared to go any place else because the U.S. is the best and safest place in the world. <laughs> That's the message you're inundated with. And if you actually travel, you quickly realize that's that's just not true. <laughs> no. Yeah, there's a lot of unsafe, terrible places in the world, but there's a lot of, you know, pretty amazing, awesome places in the world where you can have, you know, a pretty damn good time with your life. I, I agree. Now, going on from your background of teaching yourself architecture, are you um What's your educational background? Are you a professor, a self-taught? Did you go to the formal university? I'm self-taught. I'm entirely self-taught. Yeah, I, oh. I, I went to college for a few semesters, and you know, I, I I wasn't learning anything, so I was like, I I can I can spend my time a lot better than than memorizing things that I'm never going to use. <laughs> The people on no, one, the of, one of my biggest problems with the educational system, you know, at least my exposure to the educational system is it didn't teach me how to reason, how to think. It just taught me how to memorize things. And, you know, the ability to reason, to be skeptical, to not, you know, to not buy whatever explanation is offered, um, to be skeptical. Um, I believe that that's been drilled out of the educational system. And I think it's by design. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm very I, opinionated about I know. this. No, no, I agree 100 percent with you because I don't know if you if you want to tell your age because you know, the show is pretty open. You know, we use profanity here. If you don't, that's cool. But I'll be 49 next month, and I grew up in the educational system. If you didn't do your work, you got left back. There were consequences, and I think all of that stuff has been removed because people have this expectation of doing well, whether they put forth the effort. And another thing about you being a hundred percent self-taught that you taught yourself architecture, you taught yourself how to start a business. And then what did you do after that? Because how many businesses did you have before you started writing? Oh, I've had, I don't know. I mean, I had an import export company. I had uh, a wine. Uh, I made wine in Argentina and imported it to Mexico and the U S um, I have the design and build firm. Um, I've, you know, been an angel investor in a couple of different uh, enterprises, mainly software and retail. So, I, you know, I've done a lot. I, I probably started five different businesses, of which one was an abject failure, <laughs> one was a draw, and then three have been successful. So that's a pretty good hit rate. I would say because my first five businesses, uh, first one failed, second one didn't completely fail, but I lost money. The third one I broke even. The fourth one I learned some stuff. The fifth one was successful. Wow. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, everybody's different. It's like uh, you know, uh, it took me a while to get to the point. My first real business that I started, where I wasn't working for somebody else. I mean, that one did. That went huge. That's the one that I retired on. Okay. So. I did well, but I mean, you know, it took 15 years, but um, it it went 
really nah, it took like 12 years 13 years but um it went well um and then i started another business that um taught me a very important lesson which was basically that if you aren't planning to put in three years of 18 hour days um on your startup it doesn't matter how much money you have you you're not going to succeed so because i was under the illusion that hey i've got a bunch of money i can throw money at the problem and that'll solve it and it's like no tut tut that doesn't work um you know as a founder of a business the onus is upon you to make it successful everybody else will take your money but the only one whose ass is on the line is you and it's, it, it translates very well to the to, to my philosophy in that I, I I advise aspiring authors, which is you know I mean people hate me because I'm not you know I'm not you know I'm not ponies and and rainbows and unicorns. <laughs> I, I'm like look, this is you know you're buying yourself a job if you're successful. That's what you're doing. You're you're this is the hardest work I've ever done in my life. I, it is the most hours I've ever spent. It is the the most just grueling in terms of pressure. I happen to love writing, so it doesn't feel that much like work. Right. But if you're thinking, you know, if you're if you're buying into the Johnny Depp, you know, staring off into space, and you know, an idea comes to you, and then you write the book, and you're dating supermodels. If that's the way you believe it works, you know, maybe it can, but it sure as hell hasn't worked. That way for me. Well, well that, that, that's the quote. That's the exact thing you said when you were talking with Hugh, because I looked at my first year of writing, which was, I mean, okay, I did every mistake you could think of. Poor cover. Uh, I, I did, I had an editor who screwed me. Uh, so there was all kind of errors. There was typo. It was just a mess. But what I did do right made the difference because I started marketing the book before it was finished. And many people wait until it's finished and edited and it's perfect. And they've literally lost months of time to market yeah, they, their book. They aren't, yeah, they aren't building buzz. Nope. So now they've got to start building buzz. After writing the book, and I, I put this in a group and I left that group because everyone hated me because you think you're hated. I said, writing the book is the easy part. And like you said, it's really hard. Uh, it takes a lot of time. It can really wear you out. And if you're putting in heavy duty words, it can be physical. It can literally, I mean, my wrist used to swell up. And I was just like, you know, compared to that, the marketing is so much harder and it's even more important. And they didn't want to hear that. So <laughs> that's one of the reasons well, I found you. Yeah. The, pro the problem is that, I mean, you know, I mean, writers. Writers typically, um, you know, turn their noses up at the mundane. Well, certain types of writers, because the romance writers, they get it. They they understand this is a business. It is wildly competitive. It's retail, so you have to constantly stay on top of trends. And it's you know, it's going to require at least eight to ten hours a day. Sometimes you know, fourteen to eighteen hours. The romance, the ladies that are dragging down seven figures doing this, and I know quite a few of them that are. You know, they get it. They're under no illusions. They're not trying to write the, the great American novel and sort of like, oh, well, Steinbeck this and, you know, Hemingway that. It's like, no, it's I got to have a book out every 90 days minimum. Every 60 is better or my audience forgets who the hell I am and I'm, I'm making no money within three months. They get it. And that is but, – go ahead. Go ahead. Aspiring writers don't want to hear that because now it starts sounding suspiciously like work. <laughs> I mean, really, it does. It starts like, oh, I'm out. You know, that's that's not what I signed up for. So so and, and I hate to say it. I mean, you know, and this is going to sound completely elitist and mean as hell. And it probably is all of the above. But a lot of folks that have the dream of being a writer. Um, have that dream because it's an escape from a reality that's maybe not all that great. I would like maybe agree they 100%. aren't all that successful. I would agree 100%. So, so now they're thinking, well, maybe I can, you know, maybe I can do this and uh, maybe that'll be like winning a lottery ticket. And you know what? Sometimes it is. You know, we, you, I love Hugh. Hugh is a great example of, of how I would love if it actually worked for most people, which is he wrote a bunch of books because he loves writing. He 
you know, he, he his seventh book went viral for reasons, you know, he, even he isn't completely, you know, sure of. And the next thing, he's a multimillion. Well, super. Yeah, well, sign me up for that. I mean, it, it's great. That sounds way more appealing than, okay, get ready to work. Get ready to fail for at least 18 to 24 months before you start seeing any kind of money more than beer money. Nobody wants, yeah, you know, that, that's like, oh, boy, that sounds like, that sucks. Uh, that's another reason I brought you on because, you know, I follow your blog and you're very realistic. It's you and Dean Wesley Smith who he actually, you know, when I first started writing, I wrote him because I forgot where I was. When I started, you know, making comments in the group, I was making my comments from a business perspective, not a writer's perspective. And boy, did I get flamed. Uh, it, and he took me aside and he had this blog. I don't know if you've seen it because he's got the sacred cows of writing. And sure. Yeah, no, I, I've seen it. And, you know, it was just really a godsend for me because the way that this thing works. And I got in a lot of trouble for saying this at a group who asked me to come speak. I was like. Your book quality, if it's good, and I said this, just be really understand. If it's good, you know, you've got it edited, proofed, and all that stuff. If it's good, and when people read it, that they're satisfied you did your job. Now, the difference between a good book and a book that is excellent could be maybe 80%, you know, 20%, that extra 20% that can translate into you writing your book for the whole year, you doing 15, 20, 30 drafts. That 20% can make it shine and be remarkable. But the difference in sales would be negligible. <laughs> they just got mad yeah, at me. Yeah, I can see why. I can see why. Yeah, nobody wants to hear that. No, but it's, you know, it, it depends on which model you're buying into. If you're buying the New York publishing model where, you know, you shotgun out 300,000 titles and you wait to see which, you know, 100 hit big this year. And the others die, and uh, you know. I mean, if if that's your model, um, sure, then you can you 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 can afford to have authors spend their entire lives on one book trying to craft a diamond. Right. That's fine because it's not you that's losing money every single week that um, you're crafting the novel. The nope. publisher's not losing any money. He's waiting for you to deliver the very best thing ever delivered. Ever, 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 which is fine. I, you know, but he doesn't have to pay your bills. True, and that's so. That's else. that's where that falls apart. And that's some else. The business not... of writing versus the craft of writing are two different things. Vastly, vastly. And I was explaining to a friend. I got two really cheap book deals. They offered me five thousand the first time, and then another company offered me ten thousand. And then when I explained to a friend, it's like he said, "Why don't you take it?" I said, "Well." This is how it breaks up. You get your your that that advance is broken up into thirds. You get a third upon signing, third upon submitting the manuscript, and you get your final third. I think when the book's published, and he's like, "Oh God, that's no money." Exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's why. Yes, they, we have a winner. <laughs> and I, I don't think people understand that. And then if you bring an attorney into it, and you've got an agent, it's even less. And I was just no. like. I, I couldn't do it. I, well, I was making more money on my own. That was a big reason why I was like, "This no, this is not a good deal." And I, I got in a lot of trouble, and I've really kind of modulated my opinion on this because an art, a writer's got to do what they have to do to get the best deal for them. I just think if you want to make money, go indie. If you want to be on talk shows, you maybe want to do public speaking. Then a traditionally published book would be like a passport to all those things. But if you want to make money, I don't really see anything better than indie. That's just my opinion. Yeah, that's why I didn't write. I mean, that's why I never started writing. I, it would change my mind about writing because I understood the odds very quickly. I right. was like, okay, I get that it's a lottery and, you know, but it's a lottery where I'm going to have to spend three years working on a book in the hopes that somebody gets it. And remember, mm -hmm. um, this is a business where most people in the business, I mean, they're very smart people, they're, they're well-intentioned, et cetera, et cetera, but they are wrong. They're like, they're, they're like you know, weathermen. They're wrong 90% of the time. So you, you've got to wait for someone to be right to get it. Because, I mean, look, every single book, every blockbuster book on the planet was rejected by a whole bunch of big brains that were like, no, it'll never work. 
So, you know, it's like I think Patterson shopped his first book to 30 or 31 publishers. I mean, it was a, a decent number of publishers and he was plugged in. He was connected. He's in New York. You know, he was in the ad business. He was having lunch with people that that are in the business, you know, and he couldn't get picked up. So so if, if you want to play that lottery because you got nothing better going, super do so. But I was uninterested in doing that because I was like, you know what? I got a few bucks. I, I'm just not going to do stuff that, that doesn't sound very fun. Like there's no part of submitting to agents for, you know, two years in order to get one and then submitting to publishers. None of that sounds fun to me. So I was like, screw it. I'm not going to do it because the payoff, the chances are less than 0.01% that I actually hit big. So why do this? There's too many other things I could be doing with my time that actually will pay or at least be enjoyable. So I can drink tequila instead. And then when I, I started reading about the the self-publishing thing, I was like, boy, this seems like a game changer in terms of the numbers. Because it seems like if you get to critical mass, you can make not a hell of a lot of money, but you can make a lot of money um, without selling that many books. Now let, let's talk. In other words, about you that. can be a failure by traditional published um, standards. You can sell ten to twenty thousand of a book, which would would you'd be dropped if you, you did that on your your thriller. You know, you'd be a failure. But if you sell tw twenty, you know, ten to twenty thousand of your thriller, and your you, you know your cover price, let's say, is five bucks, so you're seeing about three forty, three fifty per. You know, you just made. 35 to 70 grand off of one title. Well, guess mm. what? I mean, it doesn't take rocket science to go, wow, well, maybe if I write 10 titles, <laughs> then, <laughs> then I can make 350 grand. Well, I mean, so that, what you that, just that, said. That was where the light bulb went on. Well, what you just said, okay, my first book, I'll tell you, the numbers was I sold 2,000 copies, but it was a how-to book, and I was selling it for $25, mm -hmm. and then it points – just doing all kinds of crazy stuff all wrong because I, I had it on Amazon and I wanted people to buy the book from me off of my blog. So I put it on Amazon for ninety nine dollars and I put it on my blog for fifty nine. Now, I didn't know at the time that that was against Amazon's uh, terms of service and they didn't do anything because no one ever said anything. But more people bought the book at ninety nine dollars than they did at fifty nine for my blog because Amazon is more trusted. So sure, I made sixty two thousand in my first eleven months. From a book that Look was, you. Good for you. but no, no, from what you just said, from a New York Times or a traditional public standard, that would have been a dismal failure. No one would have ever talked to me again in publishing with that kind of record. <laughs> nobody. Yeah, and no, I just, no, no, no. You'd, you'd be nobody. And it, it just. But you know what? That money spends exactly the same. It sure does. <laughs> You know what? I've never had a car dealer or, or somebody at an airport say, no, sir, you can't have that ticket or that car because you didn't make your money the you know the, in the traditional system. It just doesn't happen. Now, guess what? I, I have nothing against the traditional system. I, I write with uh, Clive Cussler, you know, but the people at Putnam are very nice, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. Well, and, I you know, I, I'm, I'm, I like I'm, to I'm, say, you know, What's best for you? I've changed my viewpoint on it. I say if you can get a deal that works for you, go for it. Because my yeah. whole my whole thing was, and it's predicated. And one, I've got a good friend who talks to me about this stuff all the time. I have to realize that everyone's not wired like I am, and then I have to go into the conversation that, oh, okay, this is what you're doing based upon your perspectives. Because I just came in with writing from a business standpoint, and I really think that was your whole angle from the beginning. You was like, because you said. I'm not going to write anything. I'm not going to play this traditional publishing lottery. But when your business antenna went up and said, wait a minute, I can write a book. And like you said, not make a whole heck of a lot of money based upon your perspective, because you started a business and you were able to retire in 12 years. Uh, the reality is most Americans are not going to be able to retire or it's not going to be a good retirement. So for you to do something like that, I mean, you really made out well. And now you no, get tell to me I like a bandit. Yeah, <laughs> and no, you I, I myself every day. I'm like, hey, this is awesome. This this is the funny thing is when you have a business 
and you go through all of the gyrations of owning a business, dealing with code enforcement, dealing with salespeople, dealing with customers, customers, you come out a different animal. And I think, you know, just listening to your story, because, you know, like I said, I knew some of the things about you because, you know, we've talked for a few years and I've read your blog, but I didn't know that you were 100 percent self-taught. I didn't know that you had all these businesses. I didn't know you were in the software. And then on your, your Facebook page, you really get into these deep analysis of the financial markets. And I was like, OK, this is a different kind of cat. And I think that just gives more texture and uh, perspective to your writing because money well, isn't yeah, your drive. I think, colors, I, I think that in order to be an interesting writer, you have to be, you know, it helps if you're an interesting person. And the way, you know, I would think you become interesting is is you develop opinions on a wide variety of topics and hopefully they're informed opinions um, right. because you learn something along the way in order to reason your way through and form an opinion. So I'm interested in a lot of different things. And that's why I think that, you know, I can write it as often I can write as many different types of books as I do because I'm really interested in a lot of different stuff and I may not know that much about everything but you know I, I know a deep amount um, about a I think a fairly surprising number of topics because I read voraciously and anyone that reads a lot is gonna you know as long as they're they're reading something more than people magazine they're, they're gonna <laughs> they're, they're going to process a lot more information and have a lot more information with which to draw informed opinions. So uh, yeah, I mean, I look at the news constantly and I'm like, you know, just sh just shaking my head going, people believe this? Well, many people, in my opinion, are afraid to have an opinion unless they're given permission to have that opinion. And when you have well, a strong- you couldn't have said that better. You, you get, well, you have a strong opinion and you start killing sacred cows, you will be attacked. And I had to come to an understanding. They weren't attacking me because they were mad. They were attacking me because I was attacking a core belief and they had no replacement. And I was like, hmm, right. That's that that's becomes a, really scary at that point. Very scary. Very scary. So I had to modulate my message and actually think about where people were to talk to them on their level because they don't want to hear what I have to say if it's going to hurt harm or create a problem because I put up a video the other day that I had no idea it was going to be that I mean it got like 200 responses in 24 hours and normally I get 10 the first 24 hours and maybe 30 to 50 the first week but so people got annoyed pitchforks fire and a few uh, <laughs> a few and a few uh, flame uh, Molotov cocktails oh yeah uh, no it ain't the wow. word I mean I, one person has commented on that thread 12 times and he's waiting for my response <laughs> And I've been busy all day and I was like, I I'll deal with that later. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> they're ready. Well, you know, but the, there's the other thing, too, is, you know, as an author, you have to be very cautious because you're, you're told constantly and it's mostly true. It's like, don't piss people off because they won't buy your books. Like you, you want everyone to like you as a human being, because otherwise, if you if you voice any opinion that's more controversial than, you know, puppies are great, you know, then you, you're you're taking a huge risk because you may lose your readership. And I kind of look at that and go, yeah, well, you know, OK, but then what's the point? I mean, you know, if it's just a straight financial gig, then what's the point of trying to write? books that either have a message or that um, have some lyricism to them or, you know, just write the books that are going to sell the best, you know, right. Pick a genre and, you know, like, you know, vampire erotica with mm -hmm, a shifter, mm -hmm. you know, force me gay, whatever, um, you know, werewolf and, you know, hit that really hard while that's the, the craze and then go on to the next thing and don't bother with any kind of quality. Don't 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 make any pretense of, of trying to be anything more than, you know, cranking out hack work. But I think that that it's it's important to sort of like, you know, it's it's important to just be yourself, because at the end of the day, I think most readers are intelligent, um, which is why they read instead of doing other things they could be doing with their leisure time. And I think they'll see through awfully quickly if you're just being a complete phony. If you're faking it. So if you're an objectionable prick in real life, feel free to be an objectionable prick. You know, at least it's you. At least right. it's real. 
<laughs> right. Because there may be a lot of people that go, you know, I hate that objectionable prick. I can't wait to buy his next book and see what awful crap he's going to spout this time. Okay. Well, all right. <laughs> That's you fine. The point. No, no. My first book, and I learned that lesson that you just talked about. There was this forum. They just roasted me. And the owner of the forum, he emailed me. He 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 come in on YouTube videos. He just went on and on and on. And they actually he left a one star review. I was still up there. I didn't even mess with it because I didn't care. Talking about this is crap. And two years later, he wrote a book, and it failed massive. Mis it was a massive failure because his ghostwriter contacted me about information about the industry, and then I gave her this message. It's like nothing against you, but I wouldn't piss on him if he was on fire. The shit that he's done, and it, it's just amazing what people will do to you online, and then forget that they've done that, and then need you a year or two later. But I, I'm like an elephant; I'd never forget. I never forget, and that's the reason that all of my dirty stuff is under a pen name. I run under the name of a chick, and the sure. worst the worst review I have is a three star. Now, if I hmm. told my pen name, I would have a bunch of one stars within 24 hours. I know, 24, yeah. if, if yeah, not that. No, I'm sure. And th that sucks. I mean, but that's a testament. That's just human nature. I mean, there's a certain type, and I think it's born out of powerlessness. I think basically people who are who feel that they're marginalized and that their opinion doesn't actually matter in their real life, I think that they probably, you know, they, they will be more drawn to a forum where they can matter where they have power and the power to destroy um, to someone that, you know, doesn't realize that it's the power to create that is actually true power um, to someone that doesn't have the ability to create, um, you know, the next best thing is to get attention by destroying. And that's the negative review. Um, that's the one star by the person that's either jealous or angry at you personally. In other words, they aren't reviewing the quality of your work. They aren't reviewing their reading experience. They're reviewing, they're, re, they're basically spraying venom and it's, it's landing on you because you're a target. But, you know, on the flip side of that, I, I believe that most readers can easily differentiate the, the guy with the screw loose who's sitting in a shack typing out, you know, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, you know, on every, every, and, and, and somebody who's, you know, offering a thoughtful, insightful, um, you know, uh, review. So I, I think, you know, it, it sort of balances itself out. Oh, I agree because that didn't hurt my sales one bit. It, it really, because I'm not, I'll just be unvarnished. That first negative review, I'm sitting there, I'm looking at the computer. I want to address the person because it was like late 2009. And I, everyone said, leave it alone, leave it alone, don't respond, leave it alone. And I left it alone. And then I don't know, maybe two years later, I got like another one. And I was like, oh, and I just went back on with my life. But in the beginning, it for me, I'll speak for myself. It really had an impact. And I was like, well, I'm just going to push through this and I'm going to put another book out and I'm gonna put it out as fast as possible and just keep going. I have seen that stuff stop people's writing careers. Just a few bad reviews. And they just like, I'm not going to do this. Anymore. Yeah, but I mean, you know, I mean, it, it, hey, it's like dating. It's like you walk into a bar. Every every woman in the bar is not going to go, oh, my God, you're amazing. I want to sleep with you. You know, I mean, in fact, most of them are probably going to be like, you're too short. You're too tall. You're too young. You're too old. You're too broke. You're too rich. Whatever it is. Although you're too rich probably won't be one of the top <laughs> ones. <laughs> but, I mean, the bottom line is you're, you know, you're, it's a number you're, you're looking, you're not looking for for everybody to love you. Most won't. It's just like real life in that respect. Most people won't give two handfuls of shit what you think, who you are. They're busy with their own lives, so they're just not going to care. You're looking for the few people that you will resonate with who 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 believe your 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 story enough to be willing to pay you to tell them more stories. That's who you're looking for. And, you know, boy, I, I could probably write a book on just trying how to find your audience. But the synthesis of it, and you, you already know this, is just be yourself. And don't let, you know, don't let people's opinion, unless, look, 
if it's a valid criticism, for instance, if they say your editing sucks, you're a talentless hack, you know, there's misspellings every four words, you don't, you misuse, you mangle the language, et cetera, et cetera. Well, maybe that has validity. You know, maybe, maybe you do suck because everybody sucks when they start doing it. Very few people are born talented and great at everything. So there's going to be this long period in any of the arts where you're not very good. And it's just, you know, even if you're wildly talented, I guarantee you that Michael Jackson, when he first sang or danced, you know, didn't sound like the Michael Jackson after 20 years of practice. So, so you, you just have to understand that there's going to be a period where you probably aren't that great at what you're attempting to do. And you have two choices. You can either be patient and practice your craft and get better at it before you release it, or you can release it and have a bunch of people tell you, you suck. Those are your two choices. Yeah, so, and I, yeah. I took the suck choice. I, I took it. Well, I got a bunch of criticism. But you know what's funny about that? I ended up writing three books I never even thought about writing due to all the criticism. And because one guy was like, well, this is good. And you mentioned Craigslist all the time. It'd be great if you had a book about Craigslist. And I started hearing that over and over again. And then that became my most successful book, a book I never had any attention to writing because of the criticism. So you can. But that's the key to a successful business person or a successful entrepreneur. An entrepreneur, you know, hears the same information somebody else does and goes, huh, maybe there's opportunity here. Whereas I think a creative type who has no background in business and isn't entrepreneurial will go, this is a rejection of my talent or my skill or my worldview or whatever it is. It's a rejection of me. And I am going to, rather than find a way to basically make it work for me, I am going to use it as a reason to feel miserable. And what's amazing is you have the power to decide which of those two. I think people don't Maybe. understand that. I really think they, but they don't. Do, have... But there's so many books out there. There's so many. That's the basis of just about every self-help book is like, look, you get you're only on the planet for a finite period of time and you get to decide what shit matters and what doesn't. For the most part, it's up to you. So don't sweat the small stuff. Oh, no, it's true. So uh, somebody hates my book. Oh, no. You know, <laughs> oh, it's so derivative. Ew, it's so facile. It's, yeah, it's pathetic. Okay, well, you know what? Suck me off. I don't care. <laughs> you know, I'm going to go on with my, my life. You're entitled to your opinion. Go write your own book and sell like 100,000 copies of it, and let's see how many good reviews you get. So, now, see, you know, I, <laughs> Russell, Russell, Russell. See, now there you're going – you're holding someone accountable and responsible, and you're saying, look, why don't you try to do versus talk? Now, that can get you right. some pitchforks and some flames and some Molotov cocktails also. Yeah, but that's because you were trying to actually convince people. I mean, here's the thing. I have no agenda. I don't really care whether people are successful or not at being writers or really at anything else. I just want to be left alone. Right. And I want to be able to do whatever I want. So I've got no dog in this hunt. I'm not trying to sell a how-to course. I'm not trying to sell, you know, to be a public speaker or, you know, say incentize people that, you know, to, to, to believe what I'm saying. I'm just saying, look, here's how I view things. Here, here's what I do. This seems to have worked for me more often than not in a variety of different business settings. Writing books and selling books, the selling part is a business. It's the sales business. Specifically, it's the retail sales business. So if you want to just be a writer and write and not concentrate on all the business stuff, super duper, go for it. I wish you nothing but success. But if you're going to ask people to pay you for writing books, now you're in business. And when you're in business, it helps if you approach things in a business-like fashion and not based on how you feel or your sense of entitlement or why people aren't recognizing what a special snowflake you are. <laughs> I so agree. Now on the business of writing, I don't know where you are with this because I've had people ask me, and this is what I tell people. And I'm gonna give you my little spiel and I'm gonna ask for yours. I tell them to write as much as possible. Once you finish your first book, do not take a vacation. Do not have a glass of whatever you want to do. 
immediately begin on the second book because what you're going to do is become so preoccupied about what's going on with the first book that you could literally spend two or three years exhausting yourself on that book and if it's a success then your your audience won't have nothing else to get because you spend all your time on one book uh, i think the key to success is one write a lot two read maybe more than you write and three learn that you are a marketer your book is a it's a product and it's a calling card i mean the book is a really special product it's, it can serve a need, it can entertain, it can be a business card, and it can be a gateway to other opportunities. And that's where I've really kind of struggled with some writers because they don't see that. A guy asked me, you know, I write comic books. How can I make money from merchandise? I say, have you heard of Thor? Have you heard of Spider-Man? Have you heard of Batman? These are comic books, and the merchandising makes more money than the comic books. Sure. So what, what is your spill on someone who's trying to get into the writing business who wants to make money? Well, basically, you just you just nailed it. Number one, practice a lot. That's what write a lot means. Just practice. Get good enough at your craft to be able to to execute whatever it is that's in your your head and get it down on paper in a way that is competent enough so that people are willing to pay for it. And different genres require they have different bars. I mean, you know, some genres, you know, if, if it's written at a second grade level in monosyllables and, you know, you're mangling language and every sentence is six words, doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter because the consumers of that product don't really care and don't expect anything better. So super, you know, so, so write a lot understand what it is that you're trying to execute, what genre, what type of story you're trying to tell, and get good enough to basically tell the story competently. And then take your writer hat off. And by the way, one of the ways that you, you do that is exactly your second point, which is read. Read a lot. Read a ton. It's like, you know, it, imagine somebody, you know, he, I love this because I, I've actually heard this so many times from other authors. It's like, oh, I don't have time to read. <laughs> yeah, I just don't, you know, I'm not much of a reader, but I know what people want. You know, oh, I don't, you know, reading, ooh, that's, I don't do that, but I know what readers, you know, I know what a good story is. It's kind of like, can you imagine somebody wanting to be taken seriously as, say, a film director, as somebody like Quentin Tarantino? Can you imagine if Tarantino said, oh, you know, I, who's got time? I don't really watch movies. Who's got time to do that? But I innately know what people will find interesting and how to make a good movie. It's like, really, how? H how do you know that? Like, how do you know that if a Quentin Tar Tarantino, he's also self-taught, um, you know, he, he worked in a video store. And he literally deconstructed thousands and thousands and thousands of movies that he was watching. He's been studying to be a writer and director for, for since he was 12 years old. So you got to get really good at reading if you want to be good at writing. It's just that simple, and it's an investment of time. People, it's amazing to me because, and obviously I'm passionate about this. If you're like a little girl and you want to be a ballet dancer, you don't just sort of like go to three ballet classes and say, oh, well, I guess now I should be dancing Swan Lake at the Met. Like nobody, that's absurdity, it's silliness. But a lot of authors spend a little bit of time practicing their craft and then, you know, fart forth whatever their magnum opus is and expect to be taken seriously exactly like the little girl that wants to be dancing Swan Lake at the Met after her third ballet class. And it's like, what world do you live in? Because that's not the real world. This watery sphere I inhabit, does, that doesn't happen. So you plan on it taking a long time and to get good enough at your craft to be taken seriously and to, for people to be willing to pay you in order to, to write. And then the third part is real simple. Once you've gotten good enough at writing to be able to tell stories well enough to be paid for them, you then have to take the writer's hat off and put on the business person's hat and start marketing that work so people can then go, oh, I now know this guy exists and that his work is good enough. It's, it's something I would wanna buy. So that's what you're doing when you're marketing and you're promoting. You're trying to get people interested enough to 
sample you for two minutes and decide whether or not your skill level is sufficient to that they'd be willing to pay you for it. That's it. It's a whole game. I agree. Now, this is one of the things that helped me, and I didn't really understand it. As a kid, I was a voracious reader. I estimate, because I used to keep account, that's what a nerd I was, but between first grade and high school, I read 4,000 books. And a lot of that stuff started to regurgitate later in my adult life because I'm writing stuff and I was like, how the fuck do I know this? Oh, I read that book when I was in the eighth grade. And just a multitude of things. Cause I, I was, like I said, I was a nerdy little strange little kid. Uh, Thor was my hero as a kid. And I made my hammer out of a piece of copper pipe and a two by four that I cut in half and used to run around the yard with a cape on. That was my childhood. And I, it was, tons of tons of imagination because I grew up in the area of BC before cable. Uh, I remember when cable came to my neighborhood and it was, you know, many at regards, it was a wonderful childhood because I had a lot of free time to ponder. And I don't think kids have that as much as uh, they used to, but with the, the writing and I, I, I really consider myself a content creator now because I put more time and energy into videos and creating courses than I do writing because it, you know, straight up, it's way more profitable. I mean, it, it just is. It's easier, it's faster, it's more profitable. And I think after seven years of being on YouTube, I'm just beginning to get good after seven years. That's where I look at it because, okay. oh yeah, it's, 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 it just goes back to what you said. It's an investment in time. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. I wrote my first book and I know a romance writer. She had 30 books out at the time. And I showed it to her and she said, you know, if you worked on this another two or three years, it'll probably shine. And I was like, well, I don't have two or three years. I don't know. I mean, I just, you know, I just felt this need to put it out. And she said, you'll be sorry. Well, I put it out and <laughs> she was right. I mean, there was a lot of things wrong. She was right. I have to be honest about that. But she ended up filing bankruptcy and I ended up making six figures. And right. So the, everyone's got a different path and you know, you gotta, you gotta do what you gotta do. I mean, Hey, just because it worked for you or it worked for me, doesn't mean it's going to work for anyone else. Well, that's another I mean, reason you know, I brought you mistaken, on. That's why I brought that's you a on. That's mistaken coincidence and causality. It's like, Hey, you know, a dog barked and I sold 10,000 books. Dogs barking must sell books. Well, okay. Flawed thinking. But and it's magical thinking, and it's the type of magical thinking you hear a lot in author forums. It's magical thinking, and and it it's because the alternative to magical thinking is is using logic and reason and sort of going, this is a very difficult business. The odds say I will not be successful, but being self published and by working just a shit ton of hours, I can narrow those odds down to where they are acceptable for me to take the risk with my time. Because that's what I'm risking. The the commodity I don't I have a finite amount of and I don't know how big my savings account is, how much I've got left. I'm gonna expend that finite resource, my time, doing this in spite of the long odds I know you know are part of the game. Like that's how I approach decision making because I want a true and accurate picture of what I'm up against, then I can make an intelligent decision, an informed decision about whether or not, in spite of all that, I'm willing to go forward. And obviously, I was willing to go forward in writing because I just figured I can, you know, hey, I got, you know, I've got a year, year and a half to burn. I can work 15, 18 hours a day. I've done it before. I know how to do it. And maybe that can be my edge in a crowded market, in an emerging market that's becoming more crowded every day. And that's what I did. I just powered through. And, you know, but that doesn't mean it'll work for anyone else. Like, it, it, that's not the only way to do it. You know, there's other people that wrote one book. Good friend of mine, you know, Jason Gurley spent 13 years writing a, an extraordinary book. And it's a brilliant book. It's lush. It's lavishly written. Its use of language reminds me an awful lot of, of guys like David Foster Wallace and and um, James Lee Burke. I mean, it's just everything I like about a book. And he got a big book deal now after going indie. And God bless him. And so there's a lot of ways that it can work. 
But I guarantee you for every Jason that spent 13 years on a book and, you know, had a, a happy ending, there's, you know, <laughs> there's a lot more that are uh, living in a uh, refrigerator cart and down under a bridge somewhere. <laughs> and it's the same with Indy. It's like, look at the odds. I mean, they're terrible. They're still not that good that you're going to make all that much money, more than beer money. But for a particular type of personality who is willing to market and promote and who has exceptional discipline and is businesslike, it can be a great way to make a nice living. That's, that's what I tell people now. It's like write because you love, you love writing and you enjoy it and everything else. But when you put your business hat on and start trying to charge people for it, now you're in the business of trying to sell books. And that's a very different business than writing books. Big writing time. books is beautiful and it's intensely personal. It's about craft. It's about communicating ideas. You know, it's all the good stuff about art. Selling art now you're just a, you're a merchant. You're a crass, you're a carpet merchant. You're in a bazaar in Morocco and, you know, you're lying, cheating and stealing to try to get somebody to look at your carpet versus 2 million other identical carpets. Or maybe they, they aren't identical. Maybe your, your, your deal is, oh, but look at how finely wrought this one is. But again, you're in the business of trying to hawk rugs at that point. You're not an artisan that makes rugs. So just recognize which of the two. And when you're indie published, you are both. You're both. When you're traditionally published, nowadays you kind of have to do both too. But the good old days, the model was you are a, a delicate hothouse flower that okay. the publisher, you know, <laughs> coddles. And you essentially, you can be a case of arrested development that, you know, shambles around in a diaper and, you know, just write the book and we'll take care of everything else. Well, okay. That's a nice, you know, I, I, I like stories that begin once upon a time too, but I don't believe that they are anything besides allegorical. I don't take them as a statement of fact and then base my business model on my model is I'm going to wear a diaper and shamble around and, uh, you know, get rich. Well, okay. I mean, I may shamble around in a diaper, but you know, that isn't what got me rich. So it's mistaken causality. For those. Do you think that inherently or even deliberately that you treated your writing career as a startup or you just said hey i'm gonna write these books because i love it and somehow your business acumen just seeped in well no i mean i i wrote for probably eight or nine years before i actually self-published anything and i just threw the stuff away because it was garbage i was like this is terrible you know, I, I, you know, it's like every, every baby is beautiful to mommy. Well, guess what? You know, I, fine, but you know, I'd look at it and go, this is one ugly baby. So I, 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 I recognize that it would take practice to get good at it if it was something, and I, I enjoyed writing. So I just did it for fun and tossed it, you know, I'd pull, throw it in a drawer and some stuff I would pull back out two or three years later and see if it was any good or not. But mostly it was just practice. It was a way of killing time. It's a way of, you know, having any hobby or, you know, so, so when I decided to try to do it as a business, I think all the business gear just kicked into play and I had done my, my 10,000 hours of writing before I ever tried to sell my first word. So I just automatically, I had a skill level that was sufficient to create a product that I could then market effectively. No, some okay. would argue that. So certainly some of my critics would argue <laughs> that even after 5,000 words, I have yet to write more than three that are worth reading, but that's fine. That is funny because remember when Amanda Hawking came out and everybody lost their mind? I went to her blog yeah. and she wrote a lot. She wasn't, she just didn't put a book out there. She put a book out there and then she put another one out there. I think she wrote, 15, 12 books and at the time that was a lot of books in one year but she was continually sure. working she just wasn't you know just i got a book she was working 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 and if the way i understand it she did a great deal of writing before she even started putting her stuff out there and i think many people are trying to leap over that journeyman process that craftsman that apprenticeship process because the way that i look at it is writing is hard so is having the business and in both elements, in both situations, 
you will have a great deal of uncertainty. I, I'll be honest. When I wrote my storage auction book, I had no idea two storage auction shows were going to come on 14 months later. Did that help me? Tremendously help me. It was like free marketing. But the thing is, I wrote the book before they came out. And I think if you're going to do a business, you just got to get started. You just got to get started and keep pushing because what I'm seeing, and this is another reason that I wanted to bring you here, is certain business skills that you develop are transferable in so many different arenas because writing does take absolutely certain, yeah it, it takes a certain level of luck but if you're used to working insanely hard with no immediate reward i think that's like push you 30 to 50 percent ahead of everyone else before you can get started absolutely I, I i would absolutely agree and i think that you know sure luck um comes into play but luck comes into play with every business you know, oh, Bill Gates, he was so lucky, he went to the right school at the right time in history, blah, 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 blah. Oh, the Facebook guy, he was, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, he's, he's, he was just lucky. Uh, you know, I know 50 guys that had the same idea, you know. Okay, well, yeah, luck plays, comes into play with every business on the planet. So that's kind of like saying gravity comes into play. Oh, well, Newtonian <laughs> physics come into play. With it. Well, yeah, guess what? Thanks a lot, Dr. Apio. So, you know, you got any other insights for me? It's, it's like, but given that, you know, yes, fish swim in water, thus water is what they swim in. I get it. Um, luck is our way of basically trying to, to, to account for the random nature of, of chaos, of mm -hmm. entropy at work. So yes, luck comes into play, but you will be a lot luckier if you're A, reasonably smart, B, informed, meaning you read a lot, and C, are willing to work harder than anybody else. Like if that's just your edge right there is, I am willing to work harder than any other person on the planet in order to be successful at X, you will be a lot luckier. True, true. Just, now, you know, it, it, you will. Now, how People many, don't like hearing that because, again, that sound, starts sounding a lot like you like, got to sacrifice, be responsible, you work your ass off. You may not be, you've got to fail a bunch of times in order to be successful. Nobody wants that. This is true. Now, where are you in the number? Because I lost contact. You're at 42 books now. I, I stopped counting at 40, but it's probably around 45 or 46. Okay. Right now. I I know I was going to finish the year at between 48 and 50. And so, yeah, it's a, a shitload of books. And what year did you start officially writing for Ken, you know, putting your books on Kindle? What year was that? I put them out June 2011. So in less than four years, you've amassed a catalog, a back catalog of 40 plus books. That's an amazing. Yeah, no, I. I June, July, August, September. So it is at 48. So in 52 months, 51 months, I will have written something like 47 or 48 novels. So it, it comes out, it works out to one every five weeks. That's a lifetime accomplishment right there. If, if you stop, and I don't think you're going to stop because you're having too much fun. And well, in dog ears, yeah. <laughs> 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 no, people ask me what drives you, and it's like, you know, desperation and greed. Those are the two. <laughs> <laughs> Greed's no, not Because it could stop at any time. Right, Circumstances right. can change. The market could change. Amazon could just decide to tank everything tomorrow. People could stop writing, you know, reading books. Some new form of entertainment could come along that, you know, the only old codgers read, whatever. I mean, you know, anything can happen at any point. So if you have a business, and you know this from being an entrepreneur, strike while the iron is hot, make Definitely. hay while the sun is shining, because you do not know how long that will last. So true, true, make true. your money while you're making your money. Okay. I just want to say thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. I know they're going to love you because we like frank and open and honest people, and you were all of those things and more. <laughs> well, I was going to say I have the phone number of some people who are actually frank and honest, but uh, I guess I'm a good stand-in if you can't reach them. Like. <laughs> All right. This is Russell. Well, it, was a, it was a pleasure. Uh, it was a pleasure being had. And uh, <laughs> I hope it helps somebody to get a better picture of it. And but hey, here's a, here's the good news. You know, you're one of many authors I know who most people haven't heard of who self-published and 
are, you know, in that six figure club. There's a lot of people doing that. That's amazing to me. I know. I know. It, it's, 10 years ago, that just didn't happen. Um, a lot of my professionally or traditionally published writer friends still have their jobs because it isn't because they weren't good. It's just where they are in the economic food chain. Instead of, you know, getting 70% right. of the pie, they get only a small percentage. But I think because you see it with music, too. You see it with music. You see it with movies. Uh, another guy that I'm bringing on, he created this independent film on his Canon 60D, got all kinds of awards, and he's really blowing up in the world. And he did something that you, he's doing something on YouTube that you talk about. He has right, he has uh, directors watch bad movies. He said, you can learn more from a bad movie than watching a good movie. And I really thought about all the bad books that I read. And that's where I learned the most, not the good books, the bad ones. Because you know, even well, if it was you a can read your way through my catalog, you'll you'll it's like a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. I know you gotta go back to work, so I'm gonna let you go at yeah, this I point. Actually do. But once again, thanks for coming on.